This lecture is divided in two parts. Part 1 will discuss diagnostic techniques, nutritional support, and upper GI disorders. Part 2 will discuss small bowel and colon disorders. Hello everyone, this is Doc Ina. Welcome to my lecture on gastrointestinal disorders in pregnancy. To download my lecture deck, please go to my WordPress site, Docina Obigaine. Reference for this lecture is William Substetrics 25th edition, Chapter 54, Gastrointestinal Disorders. And this is the outline of my lecture. So for the diagnostic techniques, can we do endoscopy? Of course we can. As a matter of fact, fiber optic endoscopic instruments are well suited for pregnancy. The esophagus, stomach, duodenum, and colon can be inspected this way. Endoscopy in pregnancy is associated with a slightly increased risk for preterm birth, but this is likely due to the disease itself. Upper GI endoscopy is used for management as well as diagnosis of several problems. For visualization of the large bowel, Flexible sigmoidoscopy can be used safely among pregnant women. Bowel preparation is completed using polyethylene glycol electrolyte or sodium phosphate solutions. With this, uh, serious maternal dehydration that may cause diminished uteroplacental perfusion should be avoided. We can also do non-invasive Im imaging techniques such as abdominal sonography, MRI, Computed tomography, although its uh, use is limited during pregnancy due to radiation exposure. We can also do laparoscopy during pregnancy, and laparoscopic procedures have replaced actually traditional uh, surgical techniques for many abdominal disorders during pregnancy. And specific guidelines for diagnosis, treatment, and use of laparoscopy for surgical problems during pregnancy have been provided by the Society of, of American Gastrointestinal and endoscopic surgeons. How about nutritional support? Specialized nutritional support can be delivered enterally, usually via the nasogastric tube feeding, or parenterally with nutrition given by venous catheter access, either peripherally or centrally. When possible, enteral alimentation is preferable because it has fewer serious complications. For extreme cases such as recalcitrant, hyperemesis gravidarum, percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy with a jejunal port or PEG-J tube may be used. The purpose of parenteral feeding or hyperalimentation is to provide nutrition when the intestinal tract must be quiescent. And central venous access is necessary for total parenteral nutrition because its hyperosmolarity requires rapid dilution in a high-flow vascular system. These solutions provide 24 to 40 kilocalories per kilogram per day, principally as a hypertonic glucose solution. Here are the various conditions which may prompt total parenteral nutrition during pregnancy. So we have achalasia, anorexia nervosa, appendicial rupture, bowel obstruction, burns, cholecystitis, Crohn's disease, diabetic gastropathy, esophageal injury, hyperemesis gravidarum, jejunoileal bypass, malignancies, ostomy obstruction, pancreatitis, preeclampsia syndrome, short gut syndrome, stroke, and ulcerative colitis. Some of these conditions we will discuss in the next slides. So first we start with the upper GI tract disorders. And the first is hyperemesis gravidarum. This refers to severe, unrelenting nausea and vomiting during pregnancy. It may sufficiently be so severe to produce weight loss, dehydration, ketosis, alkalosis from loss of hydrochloric acid, and hypokalemia. Acidosis may also develop from partial starvation. In some women, transient hepatic dysfunction develops and biliary sludge accumulates. This is also related to high or rapidly rising serum levels of pregnancy-related hormones, which include human chorionic gonadotropin, estrogen, progesterone, leptin, placental growth hormone, prolactin, thyroxine, adrenocortical hormones, ghrelins, leptin, nesfatin-1, and peptide YY. 
Here are some serious and life-threatening complications of recalcitrant hyperemesis gravidarum. So the patient may have acute kidney injury which may require dialysis. She, of course, may be pushed to depression because of her condition. Uh, she may have diaphragmatic rupture, esophageal rupture, which we call the Boerhaave syndrome, hypoprothrombinemia, hyperalimentation complications, Mallory Weiss stairs, rhabdomyolysis, and Wernicke encephalopathy due to thiamine deficiency. At least two serious vitamin deficiencies have been reported with hyperemesis gravidarum in pregnancy, and these are Wernicke encephalopathy and vitamin K deficiency. The Wernicke encephalopathy is from thiamine deficiency and which may manifest as ocular signs, confusion, and ataxia. Vitamin K deficiency can cause maternal coagulopathy, fetal intracranial hemorrhage, and vitamin K embryopathy. So how, do so how do we manage hyperemesis gravidarum? Most women with mild to moderate symptoms respond as outpatients to any of several first-line antiemetic agents, such as diclegis, which is a combination of doxylamine plus pyridoxine and has been proven safe and effective for pregnant women. The usual dose is two tablets orally at bedtime. Other antiemetic agents include odansetron or zofran. However, the drawbacks include uh, potential maternal effects from prolonged QT interval and serotonin syndrome. Now, when simple measures fail, intravenous crystalloid solutions are given to correct dehydration in patients with severe hyperemesis gravidarum, especially for those patients who eventually develop ketonemia, electrolyte deficits, acid-base imbalances, and hypokalemia. Thiamine 100 mg is given to prevent Wernicke encephalopathy, and this is usually diluted in 1 liter of the selected crystalloid and infuse at the maintenance rate desired for patient hydration. Now if, now, if vomiting persists after rehydration and there is failed outpatient management, then we need to hospitalize our patient. Then we can start. Intravenous hydration is continued and antiemetics such as promethazine, prochlorperazine, chlorpromazine, or metoclopramide are given parenterally. For women who continue to have recalcitrant vomiting after intensive therapy, consideration is given for enteral nutrition. With persistent vomiting after hospitalization, exclude possible underlying diseases as a cause of hyperemesis gravidarum, and this can include gastroenteritis, cholecystitis, pancreatitis, hepatitis, peptic ulcer, pyelonephritis, severe preeclampsia, fatty liver, or clinical thyrotoxicosis. This is an algorithm that shows to us the outpatient and inpatient management of hyperemesis gravidarum. So for mild cases of hyperemesis gravidarum, we can do dietary management. We can give ginger extract, vitamin B6 plus doxylamine, diphenhydramine or dimenhydrinate. For moderate cases of um, hyperemesis gravidarum, we can start promethazine, prochlorperazine, trimethobenzamide, chlorpromazine, metoclopramide, or ondansetron. Recall that these are examples of um, antiemetics. However, now for severe cases of hyperemesis gravidarum, then we have to hospitalize the patient and start intravenous hydration with thiamine. We can give metoclopramide, promethazine, or ondansetron as uh, antiemetics. For cases of intractable uh, hyperemesis gravidarum, then we can start our patients on enteral or parenteral nutrition. Okay, here is a table that summarizes the medications for gastric disorders in pregnancy. So, we have the options for nausea and vomiting, which are the following, antihistamine in the form of doxylamine plus pyridoxine, that's diclegis, as I've already mentioned a few slides back. We can give phenothiazines in the form of promethazine, prochlorperazine. We can also give serotonin antagonist in the form of ondansetron. We can give benzamides in the form of metoclopramide. 
We can also give oral options for uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Uh, usually, we give H2 receptor antagonists in the form of ranitidine, cimetidine, nizatidine, or famotidine. Or we can also give proton pump inhibitors in the form of pantoprazole, lansoprazole, omeprazole, or dexlansoprazole. So we go now to gastroesophageal reflux disease. The main symptom of this disorder is heartburn or pyrosis. The retrosternal burning sensation stems from esophagitis caused by gastroesophageal reflux related to relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. This usually responds to tobacco and alcohol abstinence, small meals, uh, elevation of the head of the bed, and avoidance of postprandial recumbency. So-called trigger foods are also or should also be avoided, and these trigger foods usually are the fatty foods, tomato-based foods, and coffee. Oral antacids are the first line of therapy for GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now, if severe symptoms persist, we can give sucralfate plus a proton pump inhibitor or an H2 receptor antagonist. Both classes are generally safe for use in pregnancy. So we can give 1 gram sucralfate tablet, taken orally 1 hour before each of the 3 meals, and at bedtime for up to 8 weeks. Antacids are not used within 1, one half hour before or after sucralfate doses. If relief is not attained, then endoscopy should be offered or considered. The spectrum of sequela includes esophagitis, stricture, Barrett esophagus, and adenocarcinoma. Next is diaphragmatic hernia. These are caused by herniations of abdominal contents through either the foramen of Boktelec or Morgagni. They rarely complicate pregnancy, and because the maternal mortality rate is approximately 45%, it is recommended that repair be done during pregnancy even if the pregnant woman is asymptomatic. Several case reports have described spontaneous diaphragmatic rupture from increased intra-abdominal pressure during delivery. Next, we have achalasia. This is a rare motility disorder in which the lower esophageal sphincter does not relax properly with swallowing. There is also non-peristaltic contraction activity of the esophageal muscularis to cause symptoms. The defect is mainly caused by inflammatory destruction of the myenteric or the hour back plexus within smooth muscle of the lower esoph esophagus and its sphincter. Symptoms of achalasia include dysphagia, chest pain, and regurgitation. Barium swallow radiography demonstrates a bird beak or ace of spades narrowing at the distal esophagus. Endoscopy is performed to exclude gastric carcinoma and manometry is confirmatory for this condition. If dilatation of the esophagus and medical therapy does not provide relief, then we can do myotomy. In most women with achalasia, pregnancy does not seem to worsen it. Management of achalasia includes soft diet and anticholinergic drugs. With persistent symptoms, other options include nitrates, calcium channel antagonist, and botulinum toxin A injected locally. Balloon dilatation of the sphincter may be necessary and 85% of non-pregnant women uh, respond to this. One caveat though is that esophageal perforation is a serious complication of dilatation. Next is peptic ulcer disease. This is an erosive ulcer disease that usually involves the stomach and the duodenum. Gastroduodenal ulcers may be caused by chronic gastritis from H. pylori or they may develop from NSAIDs use. Neither is common in pregnancy. Gastroprotection during pregnancy probably originates from physiological changes that include reduced gastric acid secretion, decreased motility, and considerably increased mucus secretion. That's why this disease is not really common in pregnancy due to the natural gastroprotection that is uh, noted during pregnancy. But despite this, ulcer disease may be underdiagnosed because of frequent treatment for reflux esophagitis. 
The mainstay of management for peptic ulcer disease is eradication of H. pylori and prevention of NSAID-induced disease. First-line therapy is with H2 receptor blockers or proton pump inhibitors. Sucralfate is the aluminum salt of sulfated sucrose that inhibits pepsin. This provides a protective coating at the ulcer base and approximately 10% of the aluminum salt is absorbed and it is considered safe for pregnant women. With active ulcers, a search for H. pylori is undertaken or should be undertaken. Diagnostic aids include urea breath test, serological testing, or endoscopic biopsy. If any of these yield positive results, then a combination of antimicrobial and proton pump inhibitor therapy is warranted. A 14-day regimen can include amoxicillin 1,000 mg twice daily plus clarithromycin 250 to 500 mg twice daily plus metronidazole 500 mg twice daily given along with proton pump inhibitor omeprazole. Next, we have upper GI bleeding. In some women, persistent vomiting is accompanied by worrisome upper GI bleeding and occasionally, a peptic ulceration is the source. Most of these women have small linear mucosal tears near the gastroesophageal junction and that is what we call the mallory wise tears. Bleeding usually responds promptly to conservative measures including iced saline irrigations, topical antacids, and intravenously administered H2 blockers or proton pump inhibitors. If bleeding persists, then endoscopy is usually indicated. With sustained retching, the less common or but more serious esophageal rupture, which is what we call the Borhav syndrome, may develop from greatly increased esophageal rupture. So that's it for part one of this lecture. Please continue learning about this topic on GI disorders of pregnancy by clicking the link for the second part of this lecture, which is video number two, where we will discuss about small bowel and colon disorders. Thank you for watching this video and thank you for uh, listening to my lecture. Please don't forget to subscribe in my YouTube channel and my WordPress site, Dokina Thank you.